Wonderful. Okay, so we have people joining. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Silverado Policy Accelerator is thrilled to have you here today for our event on cyber strategy in the Biden era. I could not be more pleased than to have my friend and longtime cyber colleague, Ann Newberg, here, Ann Newberger here with us for this timely conversation. Anna is currently serving as Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology in the Biden administration. Prior to joining the administration, Anne spent over a decade at the National Security Agency, where she served recently as the first leader of the Cybersecurity Directorate. She first joined the federal government in 2007 as a White House fellow working for the Department of Defense. Anne, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time, or what looks like an increasingly busy schedule, to talk about how this White House is thinking about cybersecurity particularly in light of the recent events. Fantastic, Dimitri, thank you so much for having me here. All right. Well, we have a great audience with us today on Zoom and watching on the YouTube live stream that includes an array of current and former senior government officials, private sector colleagues, academics, members of the press, and thought leaders from around the globe. At any time throughout the event, we welcome the audience to submit questions using the Q&A function, and we'll reserve some time at the end to turn to those. Before we jump in, I'd like to share a bit about our newly launched nonprofit organization, Silverado Policy Accelerator. My co-founder, Maureen Hinman, and I started Silverado earlier this year to accelerate the adoption and implementation of novel bipartisan solutions to critical policy challenges and to ensure that those uh, challenges yield concrete results. We have hit the ground running since our launch in February and with projects underway in each of our three pillars of focus, international trade and industrial security, economic and ecological security, and the topic of today's event, cybersecurity. In the past year alone, US government agencies and private sector companies have been targeted by some of the most sophisticated and far-reaching cyber attacks in history. From recent ransomware attacks on hospitals, critical infrastructure, and even food supply, to nation state espionage intrusions by, intrusions by countries like Russia, and cyber-enabled economic warfare by China. The national security implications of failing to prevent and regularly detect these attacks are too large to ignore. Indeed, in the wake of these major incidents, the Biden administration has said that defending the US cyberspace and bolstering its cyber resilience is a top national security priority. And the administration has already taken steps to shore up those capabilities. Perhaps there is no one inside the federal government or in the private sector that is better positioned to speak about America's cyber strategy than Anne, the most senior person ever to have this portfolio on the National Security Council. So Anne, let's get to it. So let me start with this. Um, it has been an exceptionally quiet time in the cyberspace since you started your job back in January. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, how's your team doing? It seems like the crises are coming at you from every direction. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for having me. You know, when you use the word quiet, I was reminded um, at the National Security Agency, there are 24 seven security operations centers. And the word that one is never allowed to use when just walking around, walking in and saying, how are things going? Nobody ever says quiet because it feels like a, a call to, to, to fate. Um, but I think in, in very much in the cyber arena, and it's great to be here, and it's great to see just looking at the participant list, so many friends and colleagues who have worked cyber issues and broader national security issues over the years. We all know, working cyber issues, that policy has not moved. We haven't made as much progress over the last decade as we needed to, to both counter the threat and effectively compete uh, from a national security perspective in cyberspace. So in that way, some of the challenges that we've experienced have created a sense of urgency, which has enabled a lot of forward progress. And that's been forward progress across the three lines of effort of the Biden administration's approach to cyber. The first piece, modernized defenses. And I'm happy to talk more in depth about each of these. The second, you know, rejoin the international stage as a leader on these issues. There are so many countries who are looking to the US for leadership on cyber issues, and we've taken strong steps in that direction already. And then finally, posture to compete more effectively to make clear um, the behavior that we find is responsible state behavior in cyberspace and that that we do not. So the, across those arcs of those three major lines of effort, I think the administration has made real progress in the first few months. And certainly we've learned from each of the incidents that have occurred. They've helped us sharpen the approach, think about where we need to do better, really appreciate where the private sector and international partners can be and increasingly are a part of our approach. So we'll dive into those areas, but let me first ask you, 
but perhaps is the most important question, which is about strategic goals. So you and I have been in the trenches on this issue for many years now. And uh, when you leave your current job in the years to come and you've accomplished everything you've set out to accomplish, what does victory look like, given the realities that nation states will certainly continue to conduct espionage and sometimes they'll be successful, given the reality that some um, actors are probably not deterrable even to conduct, uh, conduct uh, disruptive or destructive attacks. I'm thinking specifically North, North Korea and some, some others. So within those realities, um, what do you think um, in, a, in the years to come we can hope for as a victory in this domain? It's a really interesting question. And you know, the goal we always have when coming into a role and then leaving a role is leaving the place better than you found it, right? So I think from a national perspective, today we have significant risk in cyberspace across our federal government, across critical infrastructure, and certainly looking around the world with regard to responsible state behavior in cyberspace. So I think an initial goal for the administration really is driving down that risk, making big leaps in modernizing our defenses, really building a coalition of countries who say we want to be responsible actors in cyberspace and ensuring that we've achieved those objectives in a measurable significant way so that we understand the risk as a country we face. We've made significant progress. And most importantly, I would say two things. One, we've built the team in the United States that the government and the private sector, we have a common end goal. And we've the second key piece, aligned incentives to get there. One of the elements of the executive order, and you were very, very helpful throughout the building of the executive order and providing input and ideas and thoughts and thank you, was we said, we've got to address the problem of incentives in cyberspace. And three core areas we sought to address in the executive order and we will need to continue to build on. Visibility, it's very hard to know when you're buying a given product, is it secure? Transparency, it's very hard to know a company's or government agency's practices when it comes to cyber. And finally, market failure. How do we ensure that we start to put a price tag on cybersecurity? So the market, because essentially the software and hardware that we buy responds to that. And those three incentives, I believe, are at the core of in the United States approach, which is a democratic approach where Currently, we respect civil liberties and privacy. There isn't government monitoring of networks to drive cybersecurity. So we need that private sector partnership. And to get there, we need to align incentives and disincentives. And I think those are some of the most interesting, innovative approaches the administration um, and the president has really pressed for in these first few months, because without them, we're never going to really approach and drive down risk that we need to in this space. So let me ask you about the executive order. It's, it's an enormous executive order, 34 pages, I believe, um, uh, the largest by far, I think, in history uh, on cyber issues. Uh, very, very detailed. And you have uh, what uh, can only be described as incredibly ambitious timelines. There were 30 day, day de deadlines for agency, 60 day deadlines. We're now coming up on the 60 day deadlines in just a few weeks. So can you report to us uh, on some of the progress that uh, we have made since the signing of the executive order in May? Absolutely. And the measure we kept asking ourselves and asking agencies and frankly, the private sector throughout the process, because we, you know, some of the requirements, a number of them are, are levied on the private sector are, are our goals aggressive but achievable? We need both. Aggressive goals that aren't achievable are pipe dreams and, and goals that aren't aggressive are not going to get us where we need to go in this space, right? So to your point, um, that was a key question. And I think it really proud to say that every one of the 30 and 45 day goals were hit so far. You know, firstly, at the 14 day mark, which was the first one. And in fairness, as you well know, the executive order took several months to build. So we made sure that everybody knew and got started on the work well within the development process. No one was waiting for the shooting block to go off to get started. Um, but at the 14 day mark, CISA provided OMB with logging requirements. That was important because whether Solar Winds or Microsoft Exchange, we continuously saw that agencies couldn't answer the question of how were you compromised and what got taken because they weren't necessarily logging that activity. So we said we wanna set logging standards across the federal government. And frankly, in everything that we're doing, we're saying let's set a benchmark for what reasonable, aggressive, appropriate cybersecurity activity is, whether that's state or local or private sector, use these efforts. So we put a lot of effort into thinking about that. 
At 30 days, CISA provided OMB with guidance on the endpoint detection, and NIST began something which was really a key part of the initiative. NIST convened private sector engagement on the software security requirements, and you saw for 45 days, they issued a formal definition of critical software. The reason that's so important is because for the first time in the EO, we said we will, the federal government will only procure for critical software, software that meets certain security build standards. So we're starting to kind of press on and say, we want to, we don't want to say use that technology. We want to say build using these secure practices, building on the work that's already been done over a decade in the private sector, like the SDLC and other efforts to build more secure. So every one of the first goals were hit. As you noted, the 60 day mark has a slew of them. We've been checking in with agencies. We you know, you make progress on what you measure. So we have an interagency process that brings agencies in. And I really want to highlight and thank specifically both Commerce, NIST, and DHS CISA for, because they have key leadership roles um, in the executive order and have really been delivering in a superb way. That's fantastic. Um, but, but in addition to the executive order, you've also launched the 100-day plan in the electric sector. And there have been talk about um, addressing other sectors as well. Can you talk a little bit about those plans, um, what you're doing on the critical infrastructure front? Absolutely. So, Dimitri, those are really critical, as you know so well, as, as folks know, one of the, the real, um, one of the, the core parts of the American model is that private sector owns and operates, you know, almost 90% of critical infrastructure. And heretofore, um, the United States hasn't mandated either cybersecurity standards or cybersecurity practices. There's a patchwork of regulation um, for different sectors, but there isn't really a standard approach that says, here's the, um, the cybersecurity requirements for critical infrastructure. So we needed to approach it in a public-private partnership model. So we started with the electric utility sector for the obvious reason that power impacts all of our lives. And we used under DHS's critical infrastructure partnership authorities, we partnered with the electricity subsector coordinating council to launch this public private initiative that really puts a focus on um, encouraging companies to deploy sensors on the linkage between their information technology and operational technology um, networks. Clearly, while this program was designed and the effort was thought through before Colonial, the Colonial ransomware hack emphasized the importance of that linkage between the IT side that's often connected to the internet and the operational side, which drives the operational functionality of a pipeline, of a utility, of a meat processing plant. Um, and hence the need for really cybersecurity sensors monitoring that and trying to detect and block malicious cyber activity. So the effort has been you know, really successful with regard to the actual numbers. I think we're, I actually, I was looking because I know I had the numbers right here in front of me, you know, 121 of the 250 priority entities. So they, you know, we look to DOE and CISA to define who are the priority entities, have deployed or agreed to deploy, you know, whichever they pick, but ICS monitoring technology, and these utilities represent more than 56 million customers and include the vast majority of the big utilities. So that was exciting to see companies saying, you know, this is an important cybersecurity protection for us. Let's roll it out. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's a, it's also just deep in the partnership between Department of Energy, DHS, and the sector. And we're now working to the same effort for the pipeline sector and following that, the water sector, so we can build that baseline of of activity and of some level of uh, cybersecurity protection in partnership with the uh, with the ISACs and in partnership with the private sector. But Anne, let me ask you this because uh, no doubt that monitoring of ICS networks is incredibly important. But as we've seen in some of those recent hacks, even when those networks are not being attacked, but the business systems are, it can have direct repercussions on the physical system. If you don't know who your customers are because your business systems are taken down, maybe you can't ship that. Uh, oil in your pipeline, right? Um, um, you can't build customers, you, you can't operate. So how are you thinking about that um, impact of business IT systems taking down infrastructure even without physical effects? It's a really good question. You know, in the executive order, we put a lot of focus on developing a small number of highly impactful cybersecurity approaches, the five we keep calling them, right? Roll out endpoint technology, encrypt the data on your network, log, 
have a skilled workforce, you know, based on the size of security operations center, and of course, the most important multi-factor authentication. And the reason we said those five is because, as you know, in IT networks, we're continuously seeing compromise and compromise of the kind of things, you know, folks know, have known for a decade are the practices that organizations should have in place. So we said, maybe the problem is, it's not really crystal clear that these five technologies when deployed, significantly reduce the risk. So one of the reasons we said we in the federal government are gonna show how important this is by actually doing it. That's the most important message. When we put our money on it, and I think you saw in the ARP plan, there was money to put against it. By putting an aggressive timeline, there's six months timelines for those across large federal agencies. And frankly, by calling for it, as you saw in the open letter that the administration um, asked me to issue to the private sector, you know, post the spate of ransomware attacks, when folks kept saying, what is the government going to do? And we said, we have a government strategy, we'll tell you about it, but the government cannot do this without the private sector. And I think that approach of making really clear what we expect, what we recommend, and starting to practice what we preach in that way, we hope, you know, in the US model where we can't compel the private sector, we can encourage, we can incentivize, we can show by example, we'll, we'll get the private sector to focus on the IT networks. Got it. So, so you, 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 as you said, you started with the electric sector as the most important. Do you envision covering all of the 16 infrastructures eventually with the same type of 100 day plan or will you take a different approach? We see that, you know, clearly the first one we did, we learned from. There are certain areas we're clearly refining with regard to, you know, and then we're applying that in the pipeline sector. And that's that's going to be the approach with the, of course, learning with each round, bringing in those sectors. And the cool part of it is in each of the cases, they're building the sector's knowledge and building the relationships and the link between the sector. One of the real lessons learned we've had in the hot washes after a number of these ransomware attacks, because internally, as you know, you know, um, first on the NSC, we did a review of the solar winds study of the solar winds case to see what we could learn from it. Then we did a hot wash from Colonial to see what we could learn from it. And we learned the linkage between cyber and physical. Clearly, whether it was a pipeline, whether it was a meat processing plant, a deeper understanding of the sector. Where are the choke points in the sector? Where are the backups in the sector? How much, you know, we've all moved in a fascinating way. We've moved in manufacturing to just-in-time manufacturing. So there's far less capacity in these systems. Well, in the event of a business disruption, whether cyber or a tornado, there's less capacity in the system to allow for 24, 48, 72 hours to recover. So as we're now building resiliency plans, we're seeing the importance of bringing in the sector specific agencies with the cyber approach to really think through resilience in that integrated cyber and physical way. And that's one of the core lessons we've learned from these series of ransomware attacks and in the way the White House is leading and approaching these kinds of incidents. So let, let me ask you about ransomware specifically. We've seen this wave of attacks happening, not just in the last uh, six months here, but uh, prior to that, obviously we saw the hospital attacks. Um, back last year and many other industries have been targeted, including small businesses and schools and police departments and so forth. Um, you know, I've, I've said it publicly that one of the drivers behind ransomware is the availability of cryptocurrency, which allows for these pseudo anonymous payments to be made and uh, allows the bad guys to, to monetize millions, sometimes tens of millions of dollars in ransoms uh, in a way that uh, keeps their identities anonymous. Uh, the Treasury Department issued um, um, uh, draft guidance, uh, I believe back in December on requiring um, KYC, know your customer rules on cryptocurrency transactions of a certain size to try to provide some transparency uh, within the cryptocurrency community, um, which obviously would be helpful on many fronts, including uh, drug trafficking and money laundering, all kinds of other things. But on, on ransomware in particular, I think it can have a very big effect. Can you Give us an update on where that stands and how you're thinking more broadly about the relationship between ransomware payments and cryptocurrency. You were very correct when you noted the role of cryptocurrency in the rise of ransomware. It allows for global easy funds movements. And while there is a public blockchain, it requires a different level of analysis to understand who the actor is. And we've also seen increasingly anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies like Monero, which make that work harder. 
So Treasury has regulated virtual currency and financial institutions for over a decade. And the United States, as you noted, is one of the most sophisticated know your customer regimes. However, um, we are working with international partners via the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, to help grow capacity in both the blockchain cryptocurrency analysis, in building those same regulatory regimes in various countries around the world. You know, ransomware has created a sense of urgency where many countries around the world have been the victims of ransom of ransomware. You've seen that in French and German hospitals. The Irish healthcare system was a very recent example. So Treasury's work has never been more important, both on the helping other countries build those regulatory models, on the building U.S. capacity to do blockchain analysis to help others, as well as, frankly, to think about these are living systems and how we should consider um, using the broader spate of actors, um, the SEC's capabilities, the capabilities under various authorities like the Bank Secrecy Act, to help us with another challenge related to ransomware, which is visibility. Today, the US government often struggles to have adequate visibility of ransomware activity. That makes it harder to pursue ransomware actors from a law enforcement perspective, from a disruption perspective, and to build thoughtful and effective policy, understanding what we're facing. Because I think one of the things we're facing most is tying very much to the first part of our conversation, Dimitri, is how to incentivize companies to put in place the resilience needed to make them a harder target against ransomware. Um, and that's one part of it. And I think that there's a role for insurance companies um, in setting those, and some already do, in setting those standards. I think there's a role for ensuring greater visibility. And I think there's a role for considering how cryptocurrency exchanges and the broader um, virtual currency ecosystem, where the lever points are to separate valid investments or use of cryptocurrency from, launder, from using it to launder illicit funds. One of the things that the Colonial and the GBS hacks um, uh, created from a debate perspective is um, uh, this issue of ransom payments. And uh, there are people on both sides of the issue, whether uh, people should be allowed to pay ransom or not. It strikes me a lot like the hostage rescue debate uh, that we've had for decades about whether families should pay hostage, uh, hostage uh, uh, money to rescue hostages, an issue that I know is very personal to you as well. Um, but um, wh where do you stand on this issue? I mean, from my perspective, companies don't pay ransom because they want to turn over millions of dollars to criminals. Um, they do it out of necessity to, to um, keep their business up and running and victimize them further by prohibiting payments doesn't seem to me like a good idea. Uh, but um, what, what are your thoughts on this? You just captured the crux of why it's such a difficult policy decision. We know that the ransom payments drive the growth of ransom. It's pretty obvious, right? Criminals are often doing it for the financial gain. So it's driving the increase in the number of uh, ransomware attacks, it's driving an increase in the size of ransom payments and the increasing targeting of larger and larger organizations who it's perceived have greater resources to pay larger and larger ransoms. So the US government's policy has been very clear that we highly discourage the payment of ransom because it's what's driving this ecosystem. Full stop, for all the reasons you noted, if a company is the victim of ransomware, for various reasons, and you know, we won't discuss how they got to where they got. Um, um, they're in a difficult spot. So, what we're thinking through is there is a process that brings a company to that difficult place. What are the incentives along the way um, that we can do to really reshape that process? How do we? You know, I think more and more companies have become sensitive to the impact on business continuity that ransomware represents. You know, perhaps in the past it was viewed as, oh, it's just a, they're going to you know, empty a bank account or they're going to steal some data. Now it's recognized they can disrupt a company's business right? and fundamentally dis disrupt the broader economy, disrupt jobs, et cetera. So you know, incentivizing companies, building that resilience thinking about public companies and how some of the secrecy around ransom payments would make boards take more responsibility, look at this issue, akin to the way we looked at you know, accounting controls a decade ago. 
um, and internal controls a decade ago. So thinking through that process to say, where are the levers we can press to build resilience? And then the reason we've built such a really integrated, holistic um, ransomware strategy, the reason the president has really asked us to think through and bring all elements of the U.S. government together on our ransom strategy is to recognize that no one element is going to achieve the objective, but bringing those together holistically in a coordinated way will. And that includes um, disrupting via law enforcement and, and other methods, ransom actors, ransom networks, working closely with the private sector. It certainly includes, as I mentioned, building capacity in cryptocurrency to be able to pursue those illicit funds payments, helping working with our international partners to hold countries accountable who harbor ransomware actors. Certainly the ransom policy, one of the more difficult ones, and of course the resilience efforts. Um, and that's really part of the holistic approach we're using because any one will be insufficient. And the one you cited is one of the toughest among all and has to really be approached with a lot of careful thought, thinking second and third order effects um, in, in thinking through that. So, so prior to, to uh, coming to the White House, you, you spent uh, over a decade at the NSA, you helped to set up Cyber Command. Do you think they have a big role to play in this ransomware epidemic? It strikes me that um, Cyber Command in particular was quite effective during the ISIS campaign in Syria that's now been declassified, uh, Task Force Ares. And um, uh, I think a lot of the lessons from that campaign could be applied to ransomware actors, given that we're not dealing with that huge of an ecosystem. There are probably less than 200 people that are sort of key to ransom um, attacks, sort of the, the kingpins behind it, and uh, bringing the power of the US intelligence community to bear on them could have dramatic effects. Is that part of the strategy? Certainly, we're looking at every element of the US government. I think you saw the efforts that were made public against TrickBot, which were a combined FBI, Cyber Command, was a private sector role as well. Certainly that served as a model to say where we identify actors and infrastructure that are used um, to target, um, to, to conduct ransomware attacks, we want to ensure that we make it a lot harder for those actors to operate. So I think the model you saw there, the model you saw with the FBI, with a number of law enforcement agencies around the world a number of months ago, are certainly a part, uh, a tool in the toolbox we need to use to combat ransomware. Let me bring um, you back to the nation state issue. So um, we, we saw the solar winds campaign and, and administration took um, hard action against Russia with sanctions um, that were put in place, I believe in March um, um, on SVR and other actors that were responsible. But at the same time, we saw this Microsoft exchange campaign that was actually much more disruptive um, and destructive, um, um, and in my view, quite careless, um, where the Chinese actors were able to infiltrate those servers, leave them wide open for further exploitation by other actors, including ransomware actors that we've seen target um, those exchange servers. Um, we have not yet seen action from the administration on that front. Um, um, do, do you think it's coming? Um, any, anything you can give us on that uh, issue? So first, I want to know, um, to your point, the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability was a very significant area of concern. And it really led us to innovate in the way the White House led the response for it. As you know, the, the way the White House manages significant incidents is via something called the Unified Coordination Group. For the first time, we invited private sector partners to participate. You know, we went to our attorneys and said, we'd like to include them. They have key insights both in the threat um, and in understanding how it's remediated. And they said, well, you know, the, the, the authority allows for it. So we included in that, we learned a great deal, both in terms of building a common picture of the number of vulnerable servers where they were, and most importantly, of the success of our joint efforts in reducing that. And in fact, based on the extensive outreach um, the administration did, we learned that companies were, and small government agencies and government agencies we're struggling to patch because in order to do the most recent patch, you had to have patched every prior patch. And there were many, which speaks to the issues of software and hardware vulnerabilities um, and really one of the root causes of cybersecurity issues um, that and the need to, to modernize that approach. Um, 
And as a result, in speaking with Microsoft, we said, you've got to make this easier, right? And Microsoft jumped on it and released a one-click tool. And we literally saw the number of vulnerable servers jump from 140,000 to less than 10 in a week. So it speaks to both uh, enabling users to do what they need to do and the role of public-private partnership in focused efforts. So I just want to highlight that both as a, in a humble way, acknowledging what we learned um, and saying, this will be the way we, we do this in the future. Um, I think you saw the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, say that we will attribute um, that activity. And, um, and along with that, you know, of course, determine what needs to, to do as a follow up from that. And, and I think, you know, you'll be seeing further on that in the coming weeks. Great. Um, one of the things that happened in the last few weeks um, is, of course, our dear old friend, Chris Inglis, has been confirmed now as a new National Cyber Director. Um, you work with Chris for many, many years at the NSA, of course. Um, can you talk us a little bit about how you see his organization, the NCD, um, that's uh, going to be newly stood up in the White House, uh, working with um, your office at the National Security Council? Where do you see um, interfaces and, and ability to cooperate? Absolutely. So I was thrilled to see Chris confirm. We talk all the time. You know, brought him in just last week to, you know, bring him up to speed on some of the some of the work that's underway. So really thrilled to work closely with Chris. As we've been talking about, there is so much work to be done. Um, so Chris, you know, will be focusing initially on three hard particular problem sets. I think as he's talked about, one really bringing. Um, you know, coherence and, and focus to federal government networks, to the way we treat them as one, um, one set of networks to be defended, addressing the governance, the technology investment um, in an integrated holistic um, way. That's one key priority for him. A second love of his, as he's talked about, is really, you know, building and growing and, and uh, in a more robust way, public-private partnership to address national resilience. And then finally, you know, everybody knows Chris knows he always talks about talent and talent is a massive issue in cybersecurity, certainly in the federal government, definitely in the private sector. We've probably all seen those statistics around 200,000, 300,000 empty cybersecurity jobs. It's something that is I'm also passionate about because when you look at you know, careers of the future. And when you look at people, some of whom may choose to go to college, some of whom may not choose to go, go to college, there's a whole spectrum of really cool cyber jobs that are waiting there. So that's going to be the third set of areas that Chris is really passionate about and really wants to work on is growing the talent to achieve the objectives we need from a national resilience perspective, from a federal government rapid progress perspective, um, going from there. And uh, on the NSC side, you know, the what the National Security Council role as it really serves is integrating and pulling together all elements of the U.S. government. As we've seen with cyber, there's the physical aspect, as in a, whether, as I said, meatpacking or colonial. There's the foreign policy aspect with regard to is this attributed? What were the objectives of the actor? How do we shape actors thinking um, with regard to malicious cyber activity, as well as, um, so bringing that together in both strategy and policy is traditionally the role the NSC plays to ensure that cyber doesn't become a, a siloed standalone thing, but is integrated with our economic policy. Many of the questions you asked today around incentives um, and with our foreign policy. So that's really the, the way we think about the work clearly with just tremendously close partnership every step of the way. Great. Uh, in, another tremendous person who has been nominated by the president, not yet confirmed, but hopefully will be confirmed shortly, is Jen Easterly, another person you know well from, from your NSA days. Um, what do you see as a key priorities for C CISA? Hopefully Jen will be in that uh, seat very shortly, but um, what, do, what do you think uh, needs to happen um, most critically in that organization? So I think you've seen Secretary Mayorkas put an early priority on cyber for DHS. He's been out there talking about it. He's been out there talking about DHS's role in the broader ransomware strategy and the focus he's put on it initially. So I don't want to get ahead of him and Jen's um, thoughts and vision for CISA. Clearly, you know, we see a, a great deal of, of leadership area for CISA. We gave him a key leadership role in the executive order, a role in .gov networks, huge amount to be done there to bring them holistically and in a framework. So lots of work to be done. I don't want to get ahead of them, but I know we'll be seeing great things out of CISA in the future. Great. 
Um, you, you mentioned um, in, in your strategy, the five things in particular that uh, from a technical perspective, you're trying to get the adoption within federal government and private sector entities focusing, focusing a lot on endpoint and logging. But one of the issues that we're seeing right now, particularly with these ransomware intrusions, but, but also in some of the nation states campaigns, is targeting of security appliances, targeting of firewalls, targeting of Pulse Secure, Cisco uh, appliances. And of course, one of the challenges that companies have is that they don't necessarily have visibility into what's happening in those appliances. You can't get uh, necessary logging information. You can't necessarily do easy forensics on them. So how are you thinking about that issue in terms of requiring broader transparency on vendors who are not just applying the software, but the hardware um, that um, uh, is very difficult to analyze when it comes to those intrusions? This is probably not the place for it, but I'm happy to answer and then would love to pose the question back um, because it's a really, you know, too often security devices are the mysterious black box that you just plug in and they're going to keep your network secure. You're not quite sure what it's doing. And many of the buyers, let's be honest, may not have, and it's not fair to necessarily expect them to do technical analysis of it. In the executive order, we tried to get, that was one of the three principles I talked about in the beginning, where I said visibility, just as you said, visibility and transparency are key. So at least for federal government, we said any purchase, any software that we, any products that we purchased, you know, three things. One, we define those software development standards. Here's how they have to be built. Second, we require that the companies do independent or automated third-party assessments and make the results available. Um, and the reason we did that was to say, look, we're, we're not interested in looking at the specific vulnerabilities, but if one product has 10 critical vulnerabilities and a competing product has six, first you start creating an incentive for companies to address it. But second, you give an ability for a purchaser to ask questions and really press for improvements in products. Because I think what we're finally also seeing, and I certainly saw this in my last job at NSA, is when we found sensitive vulnerabilities and quietly shared them with the company, they often weren't rap rapidly patched. Um, and that's a troubling factor because, again, we're balancing the visibility problem. We don't want to, you know, and I think some of the responsible disclosure processes have brought that right balance of giving company time, but also adding the pressure in if they don't move quickly. But... So that's the way we approached it for the federal government by those two particular initiatives. And it's a hard problem. So I welcome your thinking as always um, and others thinking on other things we should be doing to address that issue. Great. Um, let's go to the audience questions. And just a reminder, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom to submit the questions to us. Um, one of the questions just came in from Politico, Eric Geller. Uh, what surprising lessons has the administration learned from the early implementation of the cyber EO? Really positive lessons, which is that we spent a lot of time socializing and discussing the concepts, both within government and with the private sector, and really getting input and, and bringing many voices into the process. And I think the two standout areas that have just been really impressed by have been the process NIST ran to get private sector input on the critical software um, to really bring individuals in the, the degree of attendance, the degree of interest, clearly, the, you know, we still need to refine that. They need to be, you know, focused and direct, but really made a lot of progress there. And then the degree to which across the federal government, the concept of the five, you know, has really been accepted to say, let's focus on five things together, which significantly reduce the risk things that we can achieve, things that we can do, things that you know, we know like encrypting data at rest. If data is stolen, you know, then it's much harder for a, a malicious actor to use. The degree to which we've seen interest both in the government and, and outside on those kind of initiatives. So I think the, those have been the, the core lessons is how much really seeing the execution, the rapid and effective execution in the government, and really seeing the degree of interest from the private sector and becoming a part of it. Fantastic. Um, a question from my good friend, Sandra Joyce, who runs Threat Intelligence at FireEye. Uh, we've long said that threat information sharing is an important piece of our collective security. How can we improve communication and increase trust between the government and the private sector to help this happen? This is a, this is a constant question. Um, and my perspective on this, which may be controversial, so uh, is the goal is not threat information sharing. 
The goal is rapid remediation of a threat or preventing an attack from happening in the first place. And we need to measure whether the, and based upon that, that should drive purpose-built information sharing. I think some of the models we have today where we just essentially shoot out you know, indicators, I think perhaps were appropriate for a moment in time, but I think today we need to move to more purpose-built information sharing that says, who are the entities who can use this? Potentially a smaller number of, of entities who serve as a backbone so that many companies independent of sector can benefit from the increased resilience they may have because of intelligence or information sharing. And frankly, when there are fewer actor, when there are fewer entities receiving information, we often see the intelligence community can lean forward more because it knows who's using it, how they're using it, and for what purpose. And when we put on the scale, risk to sources and methods and purpose, improving resilience, when the intelligence community can see, oh, that company will use it to improve that product that's used by thousands of companies, individuals in the US and around the world, it creates an urgency to share that sensitive information. So I think evolving and building upon what we already have to more purpose-built information sharing, more smaller focused efforts will be, um, I think, a more successful way to achieve the objective. Let me, let me just follow up on that. Uh, speaking of the intelligence community, I think it's now two years since uh, you stood up the cyber director at the NSA, who's now led by our good friend, Rob Joyce, uh, terrific uh, individual. Um, how, how do you see cybersecurity director evolving going forward? And um, in terms of your original plans for it, um, what grade would you give yourself uh, primarily for uh, where, where we are today with that director? So in a really interesting question, what John Nakasoni sought to achieve in standing up the cybersecurity director was bringing together two parts of a mission that had historically not worked as closely together as they needed to, the intelligence mission and the cybersecurity mission, to say, when we're reporting on threat actors, yes, there's a role for a high-level reporting about what countries seek to achieve in cyber, but what's really much more impactful is what are their tools and techniques? What are their targets? Enabling both resilience and enabling better disruption operations. So that piece was key. Similarly, as you know, NSA builds the encryption protecting all the nation's most sensitive networks from nuclear command and control to DHS's continuity of government. Integrating intelligence with that so that we're constantly understanding attackers' capabilities and ensuring that the capabilities we built, encryption is at the root of cybersecurity in so many ways, is adequate as needed was key as well. So I think that integration and that thoughtfulness to say intelligence is measured by what it enables with regard to national security objectives, let's build and tighten that is really, is really key. So it applied a lot of lessons there. And I've been thrilled to see what the you know, 4,000 strong individuals of the organization now led by Rob have been accomplishing a number of cool breakthroughs in their public-private partnership. I think you saw some of the recent um, some of the recent work they did there, some of their um, intelligence breakthroughs and other interesting work that they've done. So uh, a kudos to everybody for their hard work as one key part of the broader U.S. government capability for cyber. And I think a final thought is just seeing the partnerships that have deepened so much between NSA and FBI, NSA and other elements of the IC, most importantly, NSA and CISA has been really wonderful to observe. And that's a matter of people appreciating what each bring to it and deepening that work. So another question came in from our good friend, Kieran Martin, former director of the NCSC in the UK. Uh, so he says, I take the point that the US system means you can't compel private companies to do things, but the Biden administration is now referring to ransomware as a national security threat. Clearly it is an area like healthcare. So is leaving key response decisions such as whether to pay or not to pay in the hands of private sector executives compatible with that? Kieran always asks the toughest questions because they're, they come from the deep experience he has in the space. That is the root of one of the toughest questions we have in our, in our democratic model for cyber, right? Respecting our privacy, respecting our civil liberties, and, and, but noting that our critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector, makes decisions sometimes you know, via their, their, um, their own um, considerations. So as I've noted, 
the administration has done a, a rapid process to consider um, our, our ransomware strategy. I walk through some of the core elements um, of that approach. And what you'll note in that approach is that there's space for private sector. There's space for what government needs to do. But the key part we're thinking through are the incentives for all the reasons, Kieran, you just talked about. So, for example, we held listening sessions with the insurance industry to say many companies are buying policies. Can insurance companies, and many are already starting to do this, say they'll only issue a policy if certain cybersecurity standards are met? What's the role of the U.S. government in really incentivizing that? So I welcome everybody on this call's thoughts in that area because what Kieran just asked is at the crux of one of the toughest problems in cybersecurity and protection of critical infrastructure um, in, in, in really, whether it's in the UK or the US. And certainly we've looked to some of the models Kieran built during his time running NCSC um, to think about that issue. And I, uh, I will note it's an issue that we're actively discussing and, and welcome ideas and thoughts. Another related question, surprisingly, a lot of questions coming in about ransomware. Uh, ben Wittes, uh, editor of Lawfare, uh, asks, with regards to ransomware, even if it's not appropriate to ban ransom payments entirely, does the administration have a view on whether companies should be able to keep ransomware payments secret? And that is a key issue we're looking at right now, because as you noted, we, have, we don't have adequate insight um, into the breadth of, of ransomware that's occurring because of that issue. So that's a key area we're looking at, and one of the policy areas we're, thorough, we're actively thinking through. Um, another question, the five elements that you talked about, the technology elements today, um, address the problem of today. Um, what is the next step that we should be thinking about, and what will we see out of the government as leadership? The five areas, that's a, a really, above and beyond that is the question. Yeah, so you talk about EDR, logging, et cetera, but that addresses attacks of today. How are we thinking about future proof in that going forward? When tech is built secure, we, have, we can all have a lot more confidence in it. And I think we're seeing concepts like zero trust. We're seeing concepts like SBOM, which encourage building more secure. Um, Google has a particular salsa methodology regarding supply chain concerns. So we've been carefully looking at what we see out there with regard to emerging technologies and how we, from a government perspective, can incentivize those technologies to be built more secure from the outset so that tomorrow's ecosystem doesn't suffer from what we are essentially grappling with in today's. Great. Um, and other questions from the audience. With the federal government leading the way in adopting executive order, can we expect a series of best practices and lessons learned in the forms of papers, reference architectures, or other material that can both encourage and guide the private sector as they look to adopting, adopting the guidance in the executive order? Obviously, your, your former team at um, Cyber uh, Directorate uh, is, is, has done a number of those things, but do you see more coming out? Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, uh, one question um, on encryption. Um, uh, this is an area, of course, that has been a hot debate for uh, the past almost 30 years now. Uh, the crypto wars uh, famously first fought, fought in the 90s. Um, where do you, do you stand on this issue today in terms of government um, addressing this notion of, uh, of going dark um, on encryption? Um, it is one of the most complex areas, um, as you know, from the years of debates. It's complex because from a security perspective, a government owes its citizens the ability to identify um, criminal activity and to prevent it. Um, and um, if it occurs, to prosecute it as a deterrent to future criminal activity and to, um, so that is, it's something that from a government perspective, from as US citizens, we take pride in our privacy and civil liberties. And historically, the U.S. government's approach has been to value both and to find a way to achieve both. And certainly, um, that can only be achieved in active discussions with the key private sector companies who build devices, who build encryption, who roll out encryption to help navigate and ensure that we have 
technology regimes that both allow us to do the work we want to do online with confidence in our privacy and freedoms, but also protect our society from individuals who might use those same technologies um, to conduct um, criminal and very troubling criminal activity. Great. Um, so one of the, the um, parts of your title, obviously we talked the last 15 minutes about cyber, but um, you also handle emerging technology. One of the things that, that I wanted to ask you, one of the areas that uh, Silverado spent a lot of time on is what I actually think is an even bigger problem than cybersecurity from an actual security perspective today. And that is the issue of semiconductors and the supply chain threat that it presents today, virtually all of our semiconductors on the advanced side, but even on the um, trailing edge side come from one country, Taiwan, which, um, is a, is, a, is a friend and ally of the United States, but um, is in a very dangerous region, both geopolitically, but also from a weather effects perspective. There's now a drought in Taiwan, semiconductors require a lot of water. Um, typhoons and earthquakes are, are a constant threat as well. Um, I, the, the administration has just put out a supply chain strategy looking at the broader issues, but including semiconductors. Can you talk a little bit about that, how you're thinking about diversification of the semiconductor supply chain? Because as we're seeing right now, the impacts on the economy from a shortage of uh, semiconductors that we're experiencing due to COVID is massive. Um, cars are sitting in the parking lots of factories not, not, not being built, microwaves, fridges um, uh, are not being sold because uh, we don't have enough chips. Um, and that's a sort of an artificial uh, demand constraint, uh, supply constraint right now because of COVID, but uh, a disruption to the factories, either kinetic one or uh, weather related one could be absolutely devastating to the world economy. Yes, and, and I think Dimitri, you've, you've talked very effectively about the issues. And so the administration recognizes that semiconductors are a linchpin technology underpinning the modern economy and gave a number of examples in that way. And the US semiconductor industry is among the world's best and US leadership in semiconductors drives our economic, our scientific and our technological competitiveness as well as national security. So we're committed to ensuring the health of this critical industry. And the administration has taken stock of where US leadership is at risk. And while we lead in many segments of the supply chain, our global share of semiconductor manufacturing is down to 12%. So we need proactive efforts to ensure the US remains a leading hub for R&D for the most advanced semiconductors as well. So I think you saw the US Innovation and Competition Act, which passed in the Senate, and it included over $50 million in appropriations for the Chips for America Act to support US semiconductor manufacturing, R&D. Um, of course, we support this bill as we think it will be critical to revitalizing US semiconductor R&D and production capabilities, and frankly, also addressing talent. You know, we talked about talent earlier in the talk. Talent is key in the semiconductor industry. We have to continue to invest in our domestic semiconductor workforce. And it's really an area for growth of really interesting um, and, and, and really interesting jobs to attract the best and brightest to work in the industry. So to your right, done the problem. Um, let me ask you this, though. Um, obviously, we, we need to bring more fabs back to the United States. Uh, there's funding. Um, that Congress is looking at, but even $50 billion is not enough to uh, get us from 12% to, to 100% or any, anywhere near close to that. So we're going to need to rely on allies. Obviously, South exactly. Korea has production capabilities, Germany, Ireland, Israel, many other countries. Um, how do you see both on the semi side, but also on the cyber side, um, working with allies to develop better partnerships and a cohesive strategy to confront the threats that we face? I love the way you frame that because we don't aim to reshore entire supply chains, right? We want to work with allies and partners on complementary investments so that we can have confidence in our supply chains and work together rather than competing um, to get to where we need to be. Um, because supply chain, because semiconductors are so critical both to our economies, but also to our national security missions as well. Um, and that's why we're approaching these issues in partnership with key allies, thinking holistically about the supply chain, um, but not taking, but saying we don't aim to reshore it completely. Instead, we aim to build that complementary approach and related investment as you need. Great. Well, Anne, this was an incredibly enlightening conversation, uh, super informative as well. I cannot thank you enough for your leadership, not just in your current role, but over the years in government, uh, working super hard on, on these topics. 
I greatly appreciate the audience's participation and the excellent questions that they've asked. Silverado will make this event uh, available for viewing on our website and our YouTube channel. We have another great event coming up on July 13th on the competition with China and opportunities for the US and Australia to cooperate uh, jointly. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull and um, uh, John Cacto and Amy Berra from Congress will be um, uh, uh, representatives on that panel. And um, I hope to see you all then. And again, and thank you so much. Uh, good luck and Godspeed to you and your team. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Thank you for having me. And a final just note to everyone here. These are, as Dimitri noted, these are hard, challenging issues, but really issues that the president and the administration is really focused on. So you have ideas, you have suggestions. We'd love to hear from everyone's experiences and suggestions. You know, Dimitri, as you get feedback, please pass it by because it. Uh, we certainly know these issues are so hard that the more diversity of thought and perspective we bring to them, the more likely we are to be successful. So thank you all so much for the time. And Dimitri, thank you so much for the invitation. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.